Ding Liren, you need to stay focused on this game. Yo, I don't get I know you're playing a Chinese woman. Yo, I had a Chinese ex-girlfriend as well. I get that sort of situation. But seriously, like, don't get distracted. Just focus on the chess position. You're a chess professional. You know that the only thing that really matters is winning that chess game. Oh, nice. You played the move E5, the best move. Okay, ignore everything I just said. You know, just go and just beat her and don't show any mercy whatsoever. Illingworth Chess, the best to improve your chess. What's up guys, it's GM Max here and this video is all about learning 1E4. So how exactly do you learn 1E4? Well, the way to learn E4 is to check out some of my suggested videos and also to smash that like button. That way I know to make more videos like this one. And also subscribe to the channel. I've got a little button here just on the bottom right where you can click it. Click that notifications bell and then all. That will ensure you get my two Grandmaster Chess videos each day. And we can welcome you then to the Illingworth Chess family. Alright guys, let's get into the game Ding Leering and Shu Gina. In the Ding vs Challengers Chess 24 Blitz. In the game, uh, Zhu Gina, one of the top uh, Chinese female talents, played the move C5. Of course, when learning E4, there are obviously a lot of other systems they can play. Which I've already covered in some other videos before. Like, for example, after E5, obviously, there are a lot of systems that I can choose between, but certainly lines like the Spanish or the Italian, you could say, are the two main options at White's disposal. Uh, with the, often the modern trend being the kind of play in early D3, uh, and that way you kind of avoid lines where you can go like knight takes e4. Or you can play castles and then play d3 on the next move. You know, committing him to lines where I've got the bishop on e7. So different move ones like that that can help you to strengthen your e4 repertoire and to really learn on a much deeper level by mastering very specific pawn structures that can arise. And also if we take like the e6, like obviously in the French it's a topic that, once again I've covered quite a lot where you can get like the e5 uh, pawn chain structure in a lot of different versions. Uh, so, and also for stuff like c6 again, obviously a lot of different ways that these positions can play out as well. You know, whether you go e5 for a more closed position or whether you go knight c3 or e d5 for a more open type of structure. Obviously, in terms of learning e4, the lines you're going to play are going to depend on your style as well as on what the top GMs are playing. So, certainly you can sort of know yourself and ask, well, do I prefer to play open positions or closed positions? Do I prefer to have more attacking sort of play or just more solid strategic positions? Do I want positions where there's a lot of theory and a lot of memorization or do I want some more systematic things I can play more on general ideas? And that will often dictate the lines that you kind of want to play. Because for example, lines with E5 are sort of a lot more strategic in the sense they do lead to much more close positions. But it can also be played in different ways like with H4, like being the more dynamic approach where you sort of expand on the king side and kick the bishop around. And then stuff like knight to f3 and the short system is a bit more strategic in nature by comparison. So you can sort of, then again sort of choose your systems based on what, uh, you know, what you're kind of after in that sense. So in any case, while we're constructing an e4 repertoire, I think that the biggest question for most club players and decent strength online raid players watching us is what to do against the Sicilian defense. I know that when learning e4, like, when I started out learning e4 when I was just in my early teenage years, I start out by trying to learn the open Sicilian. You know, I would meet d6 with d4, meet knight c6 with d4, and meet e6 with d4. And just play the open Sicilian against pretty much everything. But I remember that at that time I was a little bit overwhelmed by the very wide range of choices that black could play. You know, they can play the knight off, which already can even in itself be played a lot of different ways, like with e6 or with e5. There are a lot of different approaches that black can play within the knight off, and white kind of has to be ready for each of them as such. Uh, whereas also other systems like, for example, the classical with knight c6, the dragon with g6, the skaven ingen positions with pawn at e6. It's a lot of different type of positions to learn when you add it all up. So I, my sort of conclusion now is that for most people learning e4, I think now there's like there's some promising junior who has a lot of time to kind of get the experience early and kind of learn some of the theory for the positions. Uh, for everyone else, though, I would say that it's better to kind of start playing some kind of anti Sicilian. You know, in an earlier video, you might have seen me recommend the Alapin Sicilian with C3. But I think that a more mainline system that still allows you to put pressure on the opponent without having to learn all the open Sicilian fury and also kind of to get the opponent a little bit uncomfortable as well is to play the Bishop B5 lines like the Bishop B5 Moscow. Of course, it can also be played against the Ross Limo. And you could argue that it's actually an even better version when you do play Bishop G5 against Knight C6. 
because now you have an extra option that you don't have in the d6 lines that we're going to see in the main game. And as in main case, you have the option to play bishop take c6 and double the pawns. Like, for example, after g6, so in my attacking the Sicilian course, which I will link in the description below for those of you who want to really master your systems against Sicilian at a very deep and professional level. But otherwise, in that course, I recommend just going castles and like going for a c3 and trying to hit take over the center with d4. But it's worth knowing there's also the more strategic approach where you can play bishop take c6 and just double their pawns. And yeah, you are giving up the bishop pair, but on the other hand, you also get a much more flexible structure. So if d takes c3, six, you can go d3. And then put the pawn h3, just kind of kill that bishop, leave it in prison and not give him an easy good square. You know, it's very easy to play moves like knight c3, bishop e3, queen d2. And in these kind of structures, you normally have like two main plans you can go for. Like say they go knight d7, they go e5, like you're either going to play like castles and f4 and basically trade off the opponent's pawn uh, with this pawn break. Or you can go a3 and b4 and you are undoubling the pawns, but you also kind of open up the a file and open up the bishop and you get some pressure down the open files that way. So again, you just basically play to trade off one of black central pawns and that allows you to kind of make some good use of your central majority and get your piece a lot more active. My own experience, I kind of found these positions quite uncomfortable to play as black when I was a big Sicilian player. So if it was annoying for me, well, I think it can be annoying for your opponents as well. Uh, and there are other approaches, like for example, I can go e6 and you know, meet bishop takes c6 with b takes c6. But these should I think are a little bit easier for white to play, where you can again play d3, just build this very solid structure. And it's not that easy for black to kind of develop his piece in a natural way. Because if you play knight f6, you're kind of ranging at e5, and then the pawn on c5 and c6 are a little bit disjointed. But if you play a move like, let's say, knight e7 instead, and you try to put knight on g6, well, then there are annoying moves like h4, where you can play, where you kind of meet knight g6 with h5 and kick the knight. But if black doesn't have g6 for the knight, it's kind of hard to see how you're going to develop that g7, that f8 bishop and how you're going to get the king castled. And a move like h5 is not without its weaknesses, because you can go e5 and then put an on e4, and we can start to see that one disadvantage of black has it. Yeah, he has the bishop pair, but that also means he has one less minor piece to defend on the dark squares. And that means you can sort of jump the knight in, just be a bit of a pain in the neck. And it's not that easy, I think, for black to equalize here. So since it's not all that straightforward for black to prove equality against the Rosalimo, this might explain why Zhu Gina played uh, root d6, Ding went bishop to b5. And now black has a choice of different options where there are kind of three main options available if you like a choice like three lesser evils. So if you play knight to c6, you can still play the bishop c6 approach I mentioned before. But I think that here it's more effective to play the other plan, which I'm going to call the plan b, which is just to play rook e1 and just go for c3 and get in the d4 push. I think once you get in d4, you're generally pretty comfortable in these positions. You get a space advantage in black. You know, it's not made to really hit back in the center in time as such. So knight to 6 doesn't have the best theoretical reputation. You have a6, there are a lot of different retreats for the bishop, but... A nice thematic idea, as also is one you can try to find as well if you want to really challenge yourself, guys. Uh, and do make sure to comment below as well with the move that you would play in this position if you were white. So yeah, well done if you can with the move bishop to f1. It's not the only good move, but the nice thing about it is you're kind of keeping the bishop out of the way of the attack. Because you put the bishop on c4 or on a4, you get kicked by b5 and they gain a bit of extra space with tempo. Whereas with bishop f1, we kind of don't give him that. And we can go for the move d4 next turn, and that's just going to give us a nice space advantage in the center to work with. That sort of explains why the main move that you'll sort of see knight off players play, or the main trend at a high level, is to move knight d7. With the idea of trying to go a6 win and try to win the bishop pair without doubling the pawns, like we saw in knight c6, bishop c6 lines. But at the same time, white has a few different ideas he can try. You can basically more or less choose the type of position that he wants at this point. For example, you can you play a move like d4, like this is sort of the old main line, where you just take back with the queen and you sort of say that black was not able to go knight c6 and kind of kick your queen away because the knight's stuck on d7. And if they go a6, again, you kind of can choose between either playing bishop d7 and just playing this position where, you know, white has the, the extra space and black has the bishop pair and he can go e5 and objectively to balance position. Or the other Marocchi bind approach is to go bishop e2 and kind of switch back with c4, knight c3 and castles and just sort of make the argument that in a position like this, basically you are, well, sort of able just to go c4 
get the extra space and leave Black just a tiny bit passive if he doesn't play very precisely here. Uh, so D5 I think is a pretty simple answer. There is also the plan of castles and going for C3 and D4, which is still a perfectly reasonable plan in all these positions. And actually in the game we're going to see Black do this as well. I see White go for this plan as well, as a little bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, so uh, Black played move Bishop D7. And after Bishop takes, normally Black plays a move Queen takes D7. But I find that the Marachi bind plan with C4 works quite well. I went into a lot of detail in my attacking the ceiling course, but to give you a brief summary, the general idea is that up, say, knight f6. Knight c3 and g6, we're just going to go d4 and just take over the center. Takes, takes, bishop to g7. Now, I find that the move f3 is like a really so good consolidating move. We're just keeping that center really well defended. If they do try to attack this pawn with some queen c7 or a rook on c8, we're just going to play b3 and just build a very solid light squared pawn chain. And what you're going to notice here, guys, is that after bishop b3, that, you know, white's bishop is really well complemented by the pawns on the light squares because we managed to trade off our bad bishop in advance. Do I think the position is one that probably objectively black is close to equal, but it does feel like white is just a tiny bit better. He's got a little bit more space and black is more or less just fighting for equality, you know, trying to get some b5 push. But we can play moves like a6, queen d3 and make him work hard to try and get in this b5 as it were whereas white moves are kind of consolidated not you know all that uh not all that difficult from uh from white's point of view you know rooks in the center and take it from there uh but instead zirugina played a move knight d7 and after castles knight gf6 and now the move rook to e1 that ding played it was at this stage i think that black made a little bit of a dubious decision there's this particular principle as well worth keeping in mind when you're playing this uh, variation with black and it's also going to keep in mind with white as well white's best up is best going to depend on whether black plays e6 or g6 as a way to develop the bishop so if black were to play e6 what do you think would be the correct uh continuation for white in reply so there's your chance to pause video and comment below the move that you would play in this position to test your grandmaster chess understanding or rather your future grandmaster chess understanding so the answer is I think the best plan for white is just to go for a d4 move and then if he's allowed he should then put the pawn on c4 and just build that nice Marotri bind structure once again. And it also explains why you often see black play moves like rook c8 or queen c7 early to just trying to avoid white keeping that pawn or getting that pawn on c4. You know after castles and knight c3 I think or even a move like b3 is also possible. But after this general setup I think we can say that white's position is a little bit easier to play. Black's definitely very solid. He has no weaknesses and it's kind of like a hedgehog where you don't have the bishop on b7. But it's a difference where I think, you know, without that bishop, Black does lose some of his active potential. Like it's much harder to get a d5 break without the bishop supporting on b7. So I think that White's got a little bit of a nibble in this position here. Uh, whereas in the game, Black played a move g6. And I think that this was not as good as the move e6 because now, well, when they play g6, the bishop's going to g7. And, you know, that long diagonal for the dragon bishop looks really beautiful, right? But it turns out that the dragon bishop will not be breathing fire if we put a little obstacle, if we put a stone wall uh, like this. So the way that White did that is he played the move c3. And with the move c3, we're just going to play d4. This is what happened in the game, where with d4, White's got a very nice center. And I don't think that Black should have taken on d4. Like, one mistake that you're going to see quite a bit is a lot of players, like, they can't handle the tension. Like, they can't just sit there and let those pawns, you know, butt heads against one another uh, like fists. So, but by playing cd4, the problem is that after c takes d4, you're giving white a beautiful square for that knight on c3 that wasn't available beforehand. Whereas if you go castle, I mean, yeah, you would love to take your own pawn and, you know, have like a click chess where you put several pieces on top of one another, like the knight, the pawn, the bishop, the queen, and have like babushka dolls. But unfortunately, chess doesn't work like that. I think that after queen to e2 and some solid move like e6, just trying to avoid some e5, e6 pushes later... I mean, White's probably a little bit better. You know, you can play Bishop F4. You can put the Knight on D2 and try to soften up that D6 pawn a little bit. But all in all, I think Black should have a pretty playable position. I don't see anything terribly wrong. With Black's game, if he just plays Queen B6, for example, you know, it also dissuades Knight D2 by keeping a little lookout on that pawn on B2. You know, it's always good to keep your eyes peeled in chess. Uh, but instead, yeah, after CD4 now, White just gets everything that he could want uh, as such. So after castle knight to c3, well at this point black's best try might be to play e5, but it's also kind of a bit of a concession, because even if white simply takes, we kind of see that that black bishop is really shut in behind this pawn. 
And also after Bishop B3, there are a couple of squares that are a little bit weak that I can try to exploit. It's not a huge advantage, but it's definitely very pleasant where we have two results. Either white will win or it will be a draw. Or white will get flagged and lose on time. But, you know, top chess players generally don't get flagged, you could say. Uh, so black may move a6. And, you know, the problem is that black is trying to play like some sort of dragon or some like sort of night off. But and that's something you're going to see very often at the club level and in your online games as well, guys. Where your opponents are going to try to play against Anderson's if they were playing an open scene. But it's a very different system. Like when you've got the pawn side by side, you know, the two buddies work together on d4 and e4. You know, with their, you know, arms there, you know, the battering rams and the bayonets all set up. Well, in this case, white now has a very strong move. And, well, do you remember it from the little teaser I had at the start? Hopefully you did. But if not, well, that's why I like to do a revision, because practice makes perfect and repetition makes king. So we had the move e5, and e5 is just really your dream sort of break. Sometimes you've got to be careful with the timing, like sometimes you play it too soon, you might just trade off a lot of pieces, and that can help black relieve his cramp. But that's obviously not the case here. You know, if d takes e5, white still keeps a very nice space advantage. After knight g4, and bishop to f4, you know, white is keeping a good grip over this space. And if you go knight c5, trying to jump a knight into d3, white well, can just play knight d5, and we kind of see that, you know, when moves like a3, that knight's going to get kicked to a bad square. You know, it can bring the rook in, and you know, even a move like bishop g5 and piling the pressure on that e7 pawn can be really nasty for black. But in any case, after e5, black played knight e8, and just because, well, it's one sort of thing, actually, I know, like, there was this study done about, like, you know, do men play, like, riskier openings when playing against women? And it turns out, the answer is, yeah, they do play riskier openings in general, but Dingy was aware of this until he played something solid to get a safe and sure win. Playing the move e6, and the beautiful thing about the move e6 here is that you're really weakening those light squares. Keep in mind that Black did trade off her light squared bishop beforehand. Now, after takes in rook e6, you can already imagine some queen coming in and causing all kinds of havoc on that uh, on that diagonal. So after knight c7, uh, Ding put the rook back on e1. It's probably a bit more precise to play rook to e2. I mean, maybe he was a bit nervous about some rook takes f3, exchange sack to weaken the king, but it just doesn't really work when black doesn't have the pieces to back it up on the king's side. Anyway, after rook e1, I think that if I was black, I'd probably swallow my pride and play some move like e6, so at least if queen b3, you know, we already anticipated the, the check. Well, it's still much, much better, but at least the game kind of goes on here. Whereas after e5, like, this is just trying to, uh, like, sort of, you know, when, like, have a, you know, a dog as such, like, you know, they, you know, put a, a leash on it, you know, put a muzzle so it won't, like, go biting people, and it starts, like, trying to struggle, and then the muzzle just gets tighter and tighter. Well, that's kind of what happens with Black's attempt to break out here, because Ding played the move bishop to g5, gaining a attack with tempo on the queen. I think that actually the move queen to b3 first would have been even more precise, because now after queen e8, if you play queen b3, like, Black can at least try to play... A move like queen f7 to at least try to get into some sort of bad endgame. And that's not an option you'd really have available if you, uh, you know, if you had started with queen b3 and then gone bishop g5, uh, as it were. But it still works out pretty well. You know, Ding played knight to e4. The computer wants to go for this move of not bishop h4, which is way too deep for me. But I think the idea of it, if I understand correctly, is that you're sort of wanting to clear this square for the knight in some positions. For example, after queen f7 and knight e4, like if black goes d5 then it's a position where black might almost be able to try to claw his way out of it if it wasn't for the move knight e g5 and you know the attack on the queen and the attack on the pawn is a bit too much for black to bear at this point you know it's got being stretched like uh like play-doh at this point after knight e4 yeah this is a point where black actually had a chance to get back in the game you know it's sort of a nice thing about the rodley sar rosley minus moscow i'm showing you it's actually pretty easy for white to play like that is a pretty straightforward and if you do make one mistake, your position's still pretty solid. So it's quite a forgiving opening in that sense for white. But it proved to be not so forgiving for black, because black didn't find the key move here, which was to play the move d5 and start to challenge a knight. I'm trying to think what is it maybe black might have been afraid of. I'm guessing it was probably knight d6, and she was afraid of this fork. But after queen e6, I think the game is still very much afoot. You know, if d takes e5, well, if they go knight takes b7, then e4 is actually a really good pawn sack. Where, you know, you've got ideas like queen b6 to hit both the knights at once and hit these pawns. And, you know, it's not so easy for white to actually get out of this threat. Like, white's not really able to keep his extra pawn after rook c1 and, and queen b6, as it were. Um, so, therefore, I guess white would instead play d take c5 and, you know, take first. But in this case, you know, black's again managed to at least liberate her position quite a bit. You know, knight e5, we go 
Queen takes d6, because bishop e5 kind of pins your, your own bishop, which is not really ideal. I mean, after knight d3, I do you think that white is still better. You know, the knight is doing a good job of blocking the pawn. But, like, earlier, black was just very passive, like, had the weakness on d6, and the queen, like, very inactive. Whereas now, at least black's managed to connect her rooks. She's got nice open diagonal for the bishop. And after a move like knight to e6, or even putting a rook on e8, the game is, game is definitely still going on here. It's still very much a game where black has got decent chances to defend. I mean, long term, the king can be a little bit exposed, but white's not in a position to fully exploit that at the moment. Uh, but instead, after queen e6, now it just all, it goes ding's way. So we had to move rook to c1, and yeah, I mean, the threat on the knight is not so easy to deal with as the game kind of demonstrates. I mean, the computer wants to play knight e8, trying to defend this square, but if you're having to retreat the knight back to the edge of the board, that's already a big sign that this has gone very poorly for black, and that white's got a very strong initiative. Uh, like, there's a lot of good moves, White, even just to move, like, A4 and just not letting him take that pawn A2 is just very strong. Just keeping all of the options available. Because, uh, I mean, the more options you have, you know, the more chance you have to that one of them you pick is going to be good. Oh, that's because you like to have so much overwhelm of choice that you like to start, you know, do a point flip or reject the 20 good moves and play a 21st bad move. But you guys watch Dealing Worth Chess and you sub to the channel already by hitting that red button on the bottom right. So you already know not to get overwhelmed by the bounty of choice, except when it comes to while the two YouTube videos I share every day. In any case, after rook c1 and rook a to c8, well, this is move turns out to have some tactical flaws. So let's uh, break it down and see how it plays out. The key move for white, and it's a good moment, by the way, to pause the video if you want to try to get the maximum learning and see if you can play like Ding Liren, uh, greatest Chinese chess player of all time. Well, the move d5 is the key here. So after d takes e5, the problem for black is that if you play the move d takes e5, trying to avoid knight takes d6, unfortunately knight d6 is still really strong, because if that rook moves away, then that knight on c7 is left on pre, but if you don't move the rook, well, white is simply going to take it and just be up a full exchange, and actually it's even worse than that, and it's that you can even play move rook takes c7, you know, use a little tic-tac here, freshen your breath, and after queen d8, yeah, you just pick up the, the rook with this little fork, as it were. You know, it all comes down to tactics in the end to convert the advantage. So black play knight takes e5, and I mean, you could play knight takes d6 immediately. I mean, you're not really afraid of knight takes f3, because, yeah, you've got double pawns, but I mean, who really cares? It's not like they've got a queen in your face or a knife in your face. You know, you're hitting the rook, and it's just, you're winning too much material, simply. But yeah, Ding play knight e5, which is still completely winning here. Uh, a little bit surprised black didn't go bishop e5 to try and defend this pawn, at least, but... Turns out it still works tactically for white that they moved f4. It's one really beautiful tactical idea. Uh, the idea of this is that if they play bishop takes f4, that you can then go yum yum, yum yum, and then after knight d6, you're hitting the queen and you're hitting the rook and you're just picking up a whole bucket load of material. But if they play some other move like bishop b2, then yeah, you go knight to d6. I mean, you're hitting the queen and you're hitting the rook and it's just, you know, black can't cover everything at once. Her hands are tied at this point. Well, the game concluded d takes e5. As you've probably guessed by now, white played a move knight d6, like to call like the octopus show. I know like when I'm living in Vietnam, I love my you know mother-in-law's beautiful octopus recipe that she also taught my wife that wasn't gonna teach our kids. So you know, even when, you know, a hundred years now we're living in the bomb shelters, you know, from the apocalypse, well still are uh, my descendants will still be making that beautiful octopus recipe. Mmm, yummy. But okay, these jokes aside, the game ended rook cd8. White took the rook, because why not win the exchange? Takes, takes. Ruin it, rook d6. I mean, at this point, like, you can pretty much play, like, you know, random move. Like, even if you have, like, random move generated, you'll probably still win. Uh, so I played queen c2. You know, there's a million good squares for the queen at this point. Black played h5. White collected on b7. And after queen to a7, a2. A little bit surprised that Ding didn't play queen c7 and just fork the queen and rook, uh, the rook and the bishop going for the mate on g7. But okay, his move rook g7 was also enough to make black resign. The reason that Drew Gina resigned here is because after king g7, we have a little fork with queen to c7, then we stick in the knife, we get the spoon, and it's all over for black. So there you have it. That's how to learn e4. We kind of saw how Ding Liren was able to basically use very standard ideas, you know, playing bishop to b5, getting the rookie one c3 and getting that port on d4, to have the dream set when you know, the two buddies side by side in combat, you know, both wearing the Medal of Honor proudly. Uh, but in any case, now you know how to learn E4. 
do make sure to check out the suggested video at the top as well. And like I've said before, I do want to make sure that you smash that like button. That tells me to make more videos like this one. I guess you just I didn't make to fit as many jokes, but I guess, you know, you can't always be funny every single minute of your life. I mean, it's so at some point you have to, you know, be a little bit serious, right? Uh, but in any case, well, also make sure to hit that subscribe button. You know, I've got a red button there on the bottom right of this video. Make it easy for you. And also make sure to ding ding that notification bell, not just because it's a ding ding for ding Liren, but also it means when you click on the all option, you know, it has like all occasional and none. Click on all and you're going to get my two Grandmaster Chess videos each day. It's a win for you because you get the free Grandmaster training and it's a win for me because it helps support me so that I can make more and more videos too and just make these videos better and better. So also when you do subscribe, make sure to say I subscribed exclamation mark in the comments so that we can kind of see the community building, you know, welcome our newest members to the fold. So that being said, well, good luck with playing 1E4 in your own games and I will see you in the next video.